Thank you once again for joining. Um, this is our special COVID-19 session number 42, uh, a series of webinars that we have dedicated to diagnostics and related matters in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my name is Anafi Mataka and I'm delighted to be your host today. Uh, we have lined up an interesting session again today and uh, we are going to be hosting two of our partners from the industry, uh, the diagnostic manufacturers, namely Abbott Rapid Diagnostics and Beckman Kuta. They're going to be uh, sharing with us some of the innovations that they have uh, when it comes to uh, SARS-CoV-2 antigen testing, antigen sample collection. And we are going to learn more about what it takes to perform high quality SARS-CoV-2 antigen testing and its potential in transforming uh, the pandemic. We are also going to, going to get some updates from the PanBio uh, COVID-19 antigen rapid test uh, device, particularly with respect to uh, innovative nasal swab uh, sampling. Um, and to do that, we have Dr. Anna Rujanskaya, uh, from Beckman Kuta. Her role there is scientific marketing manager uh, responsible for Russia, Eastern Europe uh, at, at Beckman Kuta. And she will co present with Dr. Kuku Apia, who's a director in the medical and scientific affairs infectious diseases emerging markets for Abbott Rapid Diagnostics. This will be a one hour long presentation. Uh, that will start with the two presentations followed by a q and a i'd like to also remind you that we have french uh, interpretation available please choose the language of your choice um, from your screen on my computer it is at the bottom right you just need to click on the icon of the globe and then choose the language of your choice Colleagues, allow me to hand over to Dr. Anya uh, to take us through the first presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Anya. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anafi, for introduction and uh, first. I would like to thank you um, for invitation to this event. This is a big honor for me to present here on uh, ASLM. So uh, my presentation uh, will be uh, um, my presentation will be about antigen testing, and uh, the title is "High Quality Laboratory SARS-CoV-2 Antigen Testing to Support." global pandemic response. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to say a few words regarding Beckman Culture Company. Uh, Beckman Culture has a long history in laboratory diagnostic and uh, her first step uh, was uh, from uh, creation of PASH meter and was a long time ago. And now it's a very big uh, international company which provides a lot of uh, and analyzers and cover, covers uh, almost all areas of laboratory diagnostic, including chemistry, urine analysis, hematology, um, different others, and certainly immune assay area. Uh, in immune assay area, it has uh, a lot of different analyzers with different throughput and very broad menu of tests. Um, and I would like to say also that Bakeman Kutzer, this is a company which is part of big corporation, which calls Danaher Corporation. And here you can see uh, different companies which also which are also part of this uh, corporation. And due to the situation that our topic today is COVID for sure, I would like to say that uh, almost all these companies were involved in fighting with COVID-19 and their, their input was big. And this input was uh, um, 
from developing of vaccines to developing of PCR tests and so on. But today I would like to cover the topic with antigen tests and Beckman culture. So the demand for COVID-19 testing is rising and this is the position of uh, World Health uh, Organization, WHO, and probably the main important reasons here that vaccine distribution and therapy development are taking time and we will have to deal with COVID-19 for longer and that there is a rising number of COVID-19 cases around the world and as we prepare for the third wave on, of infections probably and quarantine fatigue plus flu season colder weather is probably people to look for alternative options to deal with the pandemic. So uh, here also the statement of VHO organization that uh, due to this situation, due to rising demand in uh, laboratory testing, uh, they state that the limited coverage of laboratory services and lo long turnaround times has meant that PCR capacity has been insufficient to meet demand in many countries, particularly in low and middle income countries. So what could be the solution here? The solution here could be antigen test. And with a shortage of PCR test, antigen testing is a suitable alternative. This is a statement of CDC organization and antigen tests can help labs conserve PCR tests for patients when the negative antigen test is inconsistent with the clinical contents and from the other side it could be cheaper in comparison to uh, to uh, PCR tests. Another very important point is time. Time is matters. So uh, PCR tests uh, would be a little bit longer and not a little bit and antigen test uh, performing will be shorter. So it can help us to uh, save time for testing. Uh, another statement uh, from European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, I would like to show you. This is, uh, they also conclude that rapid antigen test can contribute to overall COVID-19 testing capacity, offering advantages in terms of shorter turnaround times and reduced costs. But also they state that test sensitivity for rapid antigen test is generally lower in comparison to PCR, and they agree with those sensitivity and specificity that is provided by WHO, while side just aiming to use test with a performance closer to real-time PCR tests. So they state uh, the sensitivity more than 90% uh, and specificity more than 77%. Due to all this reason, uh, point of care testing certainly are very helpful in diagnostics of uh, COVID-19, but still they also can have uh, different limitations. So here I would like to show you probably the main uh, ones. So point of care antigen tests are resource intensive to scale to address high volume testing needs and uh, workflow break, uh, breaks down due to many labor intensive steps in the testing process uh, when you would like to measure from 100 to 1000 individuals and so on. And point of care tests uh, require to a lot of uh, manual steps and uh, require them to manually record patient data uh, into the uh, systems. So it also can take time. So today I would like to introduce you the new test which is created by Beckman Culture Company and this is Access SARS-CoV-2 antigen test which is automated antigen test. So according to intended use of this test, this is chemiluminescent immune assay intended for the qualitative detection of nucleocapsid antigen from SARS-CoV-2 virus in nasopharyngeal and nasal swab specimens in transport media from uh, following individuals. So uh, for uh, symptomatic individuals within seven days after symptom onset and for asymptomatic patients. 
Uh, this is the third scheme uh, how to use this test in uh, real practice. So first, this is swap collection. Uh, this is the standard procedure as well as for uh, all other tests, PCR and so on. So next, uh, samples collected for transport and it will put in transport media and <clears throat> the stability of this uh, this sample, uh, I mean swab in transport media medium will be 24 hours um, at room temperature and uh, 48 hours uh, in refrigerator. Next, uh, samples uh, will be transported for high volume processing uh, to the analyzer to the lab. Next, in lab, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, sample will be mixed with the extraction solution. So, uh, per one, uh, it, it will take around uh, 12 uh, minutes. And next, all other steps will be fully automated. All these, uh, all these samples, all these tubes will be into analyzer. Here you can see the picture of the um, analyzer with the highest throughput on the market. This is DXI 800 and uh, his throughput is uh, 4000 tests per hour and if we are talking about um, COVID antigen test, it will be 200 tests per hour, and the first result will be available in 30 minutes on this analyzer, and next, uh, all the results will be pushed to physician, patient, and lease and CTC at the same time automatically. Uh, so here you can see the uh, broad family of uh, immune assay analyzers uh, by Beckman Pitcher. Uh, from access, this is the smallest one, to DXI-800, this is the biggest one. And if we are talking about general throughput, you can find it here. And if we are talking about um, throughput uh, dedicated to um, measuring of antigen test, it will be from 50 tests per hour on access to, to 200 uh, tests per hour on uh, DXI-800 system. Here you can see uh, the uh, principle of this method. So this is one step sandwich immune assay uh, method. And uh, in the vessel, uh, we will have patient sample after extraction. And to this uh, vessel, uh, it will be added uh, solid phase. Uh, solid phase, it will be paramagnetic particle powered by monoclonal antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 virus, to nucleocapsid uh, protein. Uh, and next, after that, uh, will be added conjugate. Conjugate, this is also monoclonal um, antibody to SARS-CoV-2 virus to nucleocapsid protein, um, which is combined with alkaline phosphatase. So uh, next incubation, next washing, and after washing, chemiluminescent substrate will be added into this uh, solution. And uh, after this, after reaction of uh, chemiluminescent, chemiluminescent substrate with alkaline phosphatase, light will be uh, appear. And uh, by comparison of uh, the light and uh, cutoff value, and cutoff value uh, on the instrument, the presence of uh, absence of SARS-CoV-2 um, antigen will be uh, presented. So here you can see the summary of uh, probably the most important of the most interesting characteristics of this test. As I have already mentioned, analyte detected here, it will be nucleocapsid antigen of SARS-CoV-2 virus. Sample type, it will be nasopharyngeal or nasal swab. Sample stability of this um, of this swab in the transport medium of this sample will be 24 hours at room temperature, 48 hours at refrigerator, and uh, 30 days in frozen uh, type of um, storage or colder. Open pack stability as well as calibration curve stability is 28 days. 
uh, here you can see the sample volume. Test result will be qualitative and system default unit will be SCO ratio. So uh, based on this information, we can imagine that uh, the quantity of calibrators is two. The same is for uh, quality control uh, levels and uh, time to first result will be around 30 minutes. And certainly after this, and batch regime we will receive uh, all the results one uh, after another. Here you can see the information regarding the results interpretation. The cutoff for this test is one, so less than cutoff the results will be non-reactive and more than cutoff one the results will be interpreted as reactive. Uh, I would like to show you here uh, probably the most important characteristics of uh, different all laboratory tests. This is a uh, positive percent agreement and negative percent agreement. So uh, uh, this uh, type of analytical characteristics were received based on uh, in current situation based on two um, investigations which were performed in two uh, locations in France and in United States. And uh, here you can see the quantity of patients uh, which were involved in this investigation. And uh, here um, nasopharyngeal spaceman swabs uh, were used from asymptomatic patients within seven days of symptoms uh, onset. And the uh, method which was a comparator method, it was certainly real-time PCR. And here in the table you can see results uh, and two descriptions results were received, only two from all this, um, all this uh, uh, quantity. And um, uh, they were non-reactive uh, on access and positive on PCR. So it means that positive percent agreement uh, were, was estimated as 93,3% uh, and negative percent agreement was 100%, which is really uh, the highest. Uh, next uh, investigation was done uh, for asymptomatic patients and um, like a spaceman is, it was chosen nasal swab and uh, here you can see uh, that comparator method was also real-time PCR and here for uh, discordant results from 84 uh, patients uh, was received and it was comparable to positive percent agreement uh, 91,8, 92% uh, and negative percent agreement was also 100% for asymptomatic patients. So just uh, like a short reminder, I would like to say that uh, now there are a lot of different guidelines uh, are available. And uh, one of them, this is uh, guidelines from CDC. And here you can see the short summary uh, from these guidelines. And uh, they state that confirmatory PCR testing following a negative antigen test may not be necessary if the pretest probability is low, the person is asymptomatic or has no known exposures or is a part of a cohort, they will receive rapid antigen test on a recurring basis. And controversially, confirmatory PCR testing follow a positive antigen. Positive antigen test may not be necessary when the pretest probability is high and the person is symptomatic. Uh, um, almost the same recommendations are in European in guidelines of European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And here you can see the uh, also for symptomatic, uh, asymptomatic and recurring screening patients due to uh, low or high prevalence and they are also very close to uh, CDC guidelines and here you can see the latest guidelines. So uh, just a few words uh, regarding the investigation dedicated to cross-reactivity of uh, access SARS-CoV-2 test uh, with uh, different um, interference substances. And here you can see the uh, quite big list of uh, these um, of different um, 
pageants and the conclusion was that no cross reactivity or uh, microbial interference was observed for any tested organism. Uh, for coronaviruses HKU1 homology uh, for this type of coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 uh, was re relatively low. You can see it here. And homology with SARS-CoV uh, coronaviruses was uh, high and it was expected. This, uh, this homology was around 90%. So oh, uh, here uh, I would like to uh, provide you the endogenous interfering subs substances and the investigation which was dedicated to uh, investigation of potentially interfering substances found in the upper respiratory tract, uh, which we can uh, imagine that they could be in upper respiratory tract. Uh, so here the conclusion that uh, there was um, no cross reactivity with all this type of um, interfering substances, which you, you can find it here in the table. So non-reactive result. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to uh, show you the short, uh, the short summary of uh, comparison of Beckman culture SARS-CoV antigen test and uh, point of care antigen test probably in general. So for Beckman culture antigen test, we can state that accurate results supported with performance data in symptomatic and asymptomatic populations. So it could be used for both type of patients. It detects uh, from 3 to 97 fold or lower quantity of virus uh, than some point of care tests. Uh, it has very high throughput and it will lead to very high throughput, uh, up to 200 tests per hour. And certainly the workflow could be optimized using this test for mass screening and so on. And uh, I would like to say that uh, according to investigation which was done in USA, uh, the lower cost would be provided here in comparison to most uh, of point of care tests. And uh, finally, uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say that Beckman culture provides a very broad menu of tests for um, COVID-19 diagnostics, and it could be also immunochemistry and biochemistry and hematology, uh, different tests, but here I would like to pay your attention on uh, um, access SARS-CoV-2 antibody test, which is semi-quantitative assay, and uh, it measures a patient level of an IgG antibodies to the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 in human serum. And here you can find the diapason for this uh, test, and the results will be in, uh, the results will be numerical, and the diapason is from 2 to 450 uh, per milliliter. It is C mark labeled and the negative uh, NPA is around 100% and also it could be done uh, using Beckman culture automated immune assay analyzers uh, access to DSI 800 and DSI 600. So um, when combined uh, with our IgG and IgM assays, you get a powerful set of COVID-19 tools to identify individuals who are actively infected or have had a previous infection. Uh, it was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Anna for the wonderful presentation. Uh, colleagues, allow me to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kuku Apia uh, from Abbott Rapid Diagnostics. She will talk to us about the PanBio COVID-19 antigen rapid test device uh, with updates on the nasal swab sampling and testing of asymptomatic populations. Dr. Apia, uh, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much, Anafi, for um, inviting us to present again for the latest updates uh, regarding our PanBio um, COVID-19 rapid antigen 
test. So in October of last year, we presented um, the basics um, and the uh, product characteristics of the PanBio COVID-19 antigen rapid diagnostic test. And today, I, it's my great pleasure to present to you the evolution of the COVID-19 rapid um, antigen testing and present to you the new offerings or the additional offerings that um, Abbott would um, is making with regard to the point of care rapid uh, diagnostic test for COVID-19. So Abbott is making um, COVID-19 rapid testing easier to use so that more people can be tested in order to help life return back to normal. Um, when we look at the testing, the maturity of the testing continuum, we, we can see over the, the course of the pandemic, testing is moving, uh, moving from the traditional health setting um, into non-traditional settings, um, such as pharmacy, workplace, um, any other congregate setting. There's, there is also an emphasis on, on testing around travel. And, and as, as the evolution goes on, we see a time when self-testing will be available and accessible um, um, as the pandemic continues to, to exist. So with the, in the traditional health setting, it was acceptable to use the standard of care um, nasal, uh, nasal swab being um, provided by a healthcare worker. But as, as the pandemic is evolving, we are seeing the need to have um, the ab ability to um, rapidly and repeatedly test people in non-traditional um, health settings. And also the need for, um, for maybe lower scales of healthcare workers to be able to supervise this testing or even for um, non-qualified non, non health practitioners to, con to conduct or supervise the testing. So with the nasopharyngeal swab, uh, that is a, an invasive um, technique. If any of you have had the technique, you will, you will realize that it is important that the nasal pharyngeal swab is conducted by somebody who is both trained and authorized to conduct, conduct that. And it is on the basis of, of the uh, feedback, both from customers and from um, healthcare workers that um, uh, further evolutions have been made. And we are now able to uh, present to you our nasal swab um, and some of the uses that could uh, be opened up by the ability to use a less invasive um, sampling technique. So just to um, base uh, um, ground ourselves, we are talking about the PanBio COVID-19 antigen test that was released last year. It's an in vitro diagnostic rapid test for the qualitative um, detection of SARS-CoV-2 antigen. And specifically this test um, de detects the nucleocapsid uh, protein inside the SARS-CoV-2 CoV uh, virus. This is a highly conserved uh, uh, portion of the, the virus. And this has um, been borne out in the fact that our test is still valid and is still able to de detect the, the, the variants and the subtypes of SARS-CoV-2 that have, uh, have emerged thus far. So the um, prior to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, nasopharyngeal swabbing was, was always considered to be the standard of care due to its high performance, especially with PCR tests. And this test involves inserting the swab deep into the nasal cavity. It can only be conducted by somebody who is trained and who understands the anatomy of, um, of the upper respiratory tract. And it, uh, as I mentioned, it, it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable and at time it might be viewed as being um, a, a additional hazard to the healthcare worker that is collecting the swab um, as the patient tends to be quite uncomfortable. Um, but with the nasal swab, a research has been done, not, not just by ourselves, but a number of clinical studies have been done to, sh to demonstrate both internally and um, um, third party studies, which demonstrate the equivalent uh, performance between the nasal and the nasal swab uh, collection. The nasal um, procedure involves introducing the swab only about two centimeters into the nose, and it enables a faster. Um, it enables faster um, uh, a faster test and a more efficient uh, workflow. And patients can 
self-swab themselves, and this has been validated, and the healthcare worker can supervise them to self-swab, and the, but at the same time, the healthcare worker can keep the distance whilst the patient's self-swabs. And so nasal swabbing is now the pref preferred uh, sample collection in several countries because it, it's more convenient um, for uh, both the healthcare worker and for the patient. And especially in patients or especially in um, um, subjects who would require to have repeated testing, for example, um, um, testing um, schemes that see people testing themselves twice a, twice a week or testing themselves every time they receive a notification of being exposed to somebody, they would be quite reluctant to have repeated nasopharyngeal um, tests. And that is not the, the case with the nasal swab. So the intended use of the um, pan-bio COVID-19 antigen rapid test is that it is an in vitro diagnostic for the qualitative detection of SARS-CoV-2 antigen in human nasal swab specimens from people who meet the clinical or epidemiological characteristics uh, for testing. And it is for professional use only, and it's intended as a, a aid to the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection. It can be used in laboratory and non-laboratory se um, settings, and it provides preliminary test results. So negative results from, th from this lateral flow test do not preclude SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so if this test cannot be used as the sole basis for treatment or for other management decisions. And re negative results must be combined with clinical ob um, observations. And um, the, the test is also not intended as a donor screening test for SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are the product information. So it comes in a pack of 25 tests per kit. And the test is labeled um, nasal or nasopharyngeal according to the sample type. Um, the storage um, characteristics, so actually the cassette that this um, test runs off is the same cassette as the one for the nasopharyngeal. What is difference between this test and the nasopharyngeal test is just the sample, the, 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 the sampling um, swab that is inserted. So the nasal pharyngeal has a longer thinner, a flexible swab, whereas the nasal swab is shorter and, and less flexible. So the test time is 15 minutes and the maximum read time is 20 minutes. Um, everything that is, so the kit contains materials that would be required to run the test, but what is not contained in the kit, but what is required is the personal protective equipment, protect, including protective gloves, a timer, and the biohazard container. But Everything else that is required to conduct the test is um, contained in the um, in the pack, and this test is a manual test. It does not run off any um, machine, so it can be used in very different type of settings. And it uh, the test needs to be run soon after the sample has been uh, has been collected at the point of care and not transported to any um, central position. The the performance, which is very important. Um, um, for all these tests, and it's important for um, in-country to be able to compare one test with the other. So the sensitivity of the nasal swab uh, technique um, of the uh, pan-bio uh, test is 98.1%, and the, uh, the specificity is 99.8%. And this um, the clinical performance was also calculated. This so this sensitivity of 98.1% and the specificity of 99.8% is as compared with nasal PCR. And also we have looked at the clinical performance data when compared to a nasal pharyngeal swab and find that there's equivalence in that the sensitivity is 91.1% and the specificity is 99.7% when comparing the nasal swab with the nasal pharyngeal swab. This test has got CE mark and has also got WHO emergency use licensing. So the nasal swab can also be used in um, asymptomatic uh, people. This is very important because at least 50% of new infections um, originate from exposure to asymptomatic people. So testing of asymptomatic people in different settings is going to be continue to be a very important part of uh, disease control. 
Um, so mass screening of populations, which includes in asymptomatic people, can easily uh, filter out potentially contagious people. Given that our test um, detects um, people that have got um, replicating virus um, uh, with um, who have got active infection with a replicating virus, um, those and identification of somebody who is um, contagious, especially in the asymptomatic setting, is of vital importance. And so we see the test being increasingly used in, in specific settings such as workplaces, schools, um, airports, and in a recreational gathering. And we see frequent ongoing screening of congregate settings will reduce the risk of infection and continue um, and it informs control measures. And this, this kind of screening will be anticipated to, to, to occur even after people have been vaccinated, um, given that the guidance currently is that both the vaccinated and unvaccinated would still need to um, continue with the non-pharmaceutical measures, wearing of masks, um, um, and also then um, would be part of the screening processes that would uh, be required for um, for the different um, settings that people would need to uh, re-engage back into the community. And clinical data, both from ourselves and from external parties, have um, validated that testing with a pan bio COVID-19 device can effectively identify both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals who are contagious. So um, look, the other aspect that we would uh, like to explore is the concept of supervised nasal self-swabbing. So um, the uh, Professor Amilcar Tanu from Brazil, who has been involved in a number of our studies, um, has uh, looked at the um, patient-friendly uh, self-collected nasal swab um, and finds that, that this minimizes healthcare workers' exposure. So patients can perform the nasal swab self-collection given that it is similar to putting a, a Q-tip into your, into your nostrils. Um, and this can be um, observed and supervised by a trained professional. Um, healthcare workers can therefore then maintain a distance during the sample collection procedure, which also then minimizes their, um, their risk of, um, of, con of contamination of contamination and it min minimizes their um, self-exposure. Self-collection provides a more, more comfortable patient experience and the feeling of control around the sampling pro process. And I would like to um, just take a minute for us to listen to what Professor uh, Tanuri is saying. They, they are very reluctant when you offer to collect the nasopharyngeal uh, swab and they actually have very bad memories uh, collecting this kind of material. Uh, so the nasal is much easier uh, to convince the patients to collect. And uh, there is another point very interesting is that you can even uh, explain the patients to do a self-collection. And uh, this self-collection is much more safe because the patient can collect the, the, the self-collection specimen and the, the health worker can be away from the patient observing and it's much safer for the health worker also uh, preventing contamination and the self-collection uh, can uh, lead in the future for the self-testing uh, because uh, in, a, in the near future you can even explain the, the patient how to do the test itself and uh, you can uh, do the self-collection and expand the diagnosis. Okay, so um, up until now, we've spoken about the, the nasal swab um, and its use as um, in um, health uh, healthcare, supervi healthcare workers supervised testing and also um, expansion from a healthcare uh, collecting the sample to a supervised nasal um, nasal soft swabbing, and we've also spoken about the expansion of the testing population from symptomatic to uh, the asymptomatic. And the next uh, the next ideas that we are working with these are products that are under development and not yet available for sale. Is the self test. Uh, 
na nasal swab for consumers. So this, in this case, the sample will be collected by the consumer and um, in the in the privacy of their home or any other uh, private setting, and they will conduct the test themselves and be able to read the read the result of the test themselves. Um, and this will res re restore a sense of confidence for for um, different groups of people, adults, um, children, uh, friends and family, and allow testing in the comfort of, of and convenience of your home. And it will be an additional test to fight the pandemic. So we are looking forward to this expansion um, in our test um, indication. And also um, once we do have that, we would be able to come back and share the specifics of it uh, um, to you. So the, um, several clinical studies and independently conducted product evaluations have consistently de de uh, demonstrated the solid, solid performance of the PanBio COVID-19 antigen rapid uh, test device in both asymptomatic and symptomatic populations, and also using both the nasopharyngeal or the nasal swab collection, including supervised self-collection. And PanBio COVID-19 antigen rapid test device is currently the only antigen test that has been granted uh, WHO EUL for use in asymptomatic patients and for nasal uh, self-swabbing. So in summary, Abbott is leading the way in COVID-19 testing innovation, develop, developing and bringing to market a broad set of testing um, solutions. A PanBio COVID-19 antigen test is a rapid, accessible and easy to use testing solution for detecting COVID-19 active infection. And we continue to advance COVID-19 diagnostics and we anticipate the launch of another innovation, which will be the antigen self-test. Our goal is to collaborate with the global community and to provide testing solutions that address unmet needs so that we can all return back to work, back to school and back to normal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Apia, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, we have uh, reached to the time of question and answer. Please keep your questions and comments coming through into the chat box uh, as we are about to start addressing uh, those that have already come. Um, let me take the first question here, um, and it's from uh, Re Modisa Motswaledi from Botswana. Thank you, Re Modisa, for joining. Um, he's asking, uh, I think this one was directed to uh, Dr. Anna, what was the comparator method that you used when you presented uh, those performance um, uh, measures that you, you presented? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, the comparator method was real-time PCR. So we compared it to PCR test results. Great. Uh, thank you. I'm um, not so sure that he needs the specific one, but uh, let's, let's move on. Um, there is also another question from Ishetu Lemma, uh, who uh, says, um, the sensitivity seems low. Do you have any further research development or plan to improve uh, positivity? I guess he is talking about those two slides that you presented where you talked about percentage agreement and, and the like, kindly clarify. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you first for this question. Uh, sure. Uh, the sensitivity, um, as I have already mentioned, uh, if we will go back to guidelines, WHO and European guidelines, uh, this sensitivity is uh, greater than the requirements of um, these organizations uh, because they state uh, a higher sensitivity, a higher specificity, and a little bit lower sensitivity uh, because it will be always uh, something like balance between these two uh, points. And um, uh, sure, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, we put uh, the most important uh, 100 specificity and uh, compared uh, their sensitivity. Yeah? So uh, now I should say that uh, we, um, we develop... Uh, ah, first, I would like to say that uh, 
a lot of investigations are on track, but um, unfortunately at the moment I can show you only the investigations from instruction for use, which were approved and which were submitted for FDA and so on. So um, probably not so many that uh, are available now, but uh, on track is uh, another type of antigen test and it will be available in the end of May. And um, in that in the day in May we can um, we can show you another investigations which could be available for this test. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anna, for for the responses. Um, let me move on to the next one, uh, and this is a comment uh, that came from uh, Isha Chazila, who says uh, who, who clarified that. The pan bio antigen uh, antigen test for abroad is three EU L um, approvals, <clears throat> and uh, that includes the nasopharyngeal swab, the nasal swab, the nasopharyngeal, as well as for for asymptomatic use. Uh, Doctor Apia, can you clarify this to just make sure that we we get this right? I I think what uh, um, Shazilo, um, who is my colleague, was is saying is that. We do have all the products that we're releasing on the market are products that have got WHO EUL um, um, authorization. And so um, that should help um, countries. It's going to make it easier for countries once they have that um, in terms of their procure pro procurement processes. Um, yes, well, because we have submitted all our data through to WHO. Um, I think I, I think that's what I, that's what um, the comment is saying. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next one is an interesting question, uh, and it talks about waste management, and it's coming from Nina. Nina says, "How do we treat waste if we do the test at home? We don't usually have biohazard containers at home." Yes, we haven't yet got to the to to a, a specific method of um, waste collection um, in terms of uh, home use. What I can say is that our device, the tube in which the def, uh, the def, the sampling takes place, is a self sealed to, to, is a completely sealed tube. But yes, there will be have to be some process, and that will probably be a country specific process. Um, in order to ensure that the products are uh, disposed of in a, a, a biohazard uh, approved method once we move to the self-testing um, self process. And the kind of uh, thinking there is not new to us because we have already been working on self-testing for HIV prior to the pandemic. And we have looked at um, uh, uh, um, specific methods and maybe having the, the tests being shipped out in a specific seal, sealed bag that could then be deposited at a biohazard collection point once the once this gets rolled out on a large scale. So that will be something that needs to we need to look out once you once we get to that product and once we're rolling out that product on a mass scale. Thank you. Thank you um, once again, uh, uh, Dr. Apia, uh, for, for that. Um, also picking up on uh, is another question from uh, Hassan. I think this is so Judah Hassan, who says, with the nasal swab being easy to administer, is the sample uh, type result as sensitive as the nasal pharyngeal swab? Um, yes. In terms of our studies, we saw equivalence in the sensitivity and in the performance characteristics between the nasal swab and the nasopharyngeal swab. And not just in our studies, but there are independent studies to back that up as well. Not specifically related to PanBio, but just the equivalence of nasal swab uh, samples compared to nasal swab that compares to nasopharyngeal swab. But then there is, there is um, independent data that uh, validates that the nasal and the nasopharyngeal swab are, are for pan bio are, are equivalent. So there is data out there, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Let me pick up on one question that I personally have as well. Uh, you said the kit is written either nasal 
or nasopharyngeal swab. Can you interchange uh, the, the cassette? The cassette the is, this, is the same cassette. So you can interchange the cassette and you can interchange the buffer, but then the swab is different. All right. Um, so the, we recommend that you use this, the appropriate swab. The swabs are different. So you use the appropriate swab for the appropriate um, sample type. For example, you cannot use the nasal swab for nasopharyngeal and the nasopharyngeal swab is not optimized for nasal sampling because the nasal sampling needs a thicker, shorter swab that, and you swab from both nostrils. So um, this, this, the kit is best used as it, as it comes for the specific sample type. But the actual cassette and everything else that comes in the kit is, is identical for both the nasal and the nasopharyngeal swab. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I would like to also to thank Jen, Jen Cunningham, uh, who also chipped in in the chat box uh, and, and, and is talking about sample buffers being able to inactivate the virus. Uh, we are talking about the, the, the issue of waste, I guess. I think that's where she's coming through. And then as a matter of precaution, all rapid test wastes are recommended to be packed in a tightly sealed bag or container before being disposed in a household waste stream. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jane, for, for coming through. Dr. Anna, I want to come back on this subject of waste management. Uh, how have you addressed, you talked about the capability of running multiple tests uh, within, within, within the lab. How have you addressed the elements of waste management? Are there any concerns uh, that we should be uh, uh, worried of? Sorry, Dr. Adafi, could you repeat your question? Because I have interruption of my connection. I'm so sorry. Yes, no, that's fine. Uh, I meant regarding waste management, the waste that is produced from testing uh, on the uh, your antigen uh, testing. How have you sort of put in place or uh, mechanisms to, to, to avoid biohazards happening? Ah. Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, so uh, in our situation, it will be uh, practically uh, the same situation as well as for uh, all um, other tests. And um, uh, I should say that uh, we will have a vessel with uh, these sticks uh, inside of this uh, closed vessel and after that uh, we need to take a small amount of uh, spacemen to another vessel with a, uh, with a extraction solution and uh, and uh, and that's it so all these vessels will be utilized uh, as well as uh, all another biohazard thank thank you very much uh, for for, for that as well. And um, in, in, the, in the slides that we would give, if there are any uh, compounds that we need to be wary of, uh, please feel free to, to share as well. Um, you both touched, uh, both presentations touched an element of uh, asymptomatic contacts uh, in, and what it means when, when, it, when, when it comes to testing. And I would like to take this question again from uh, Jane, uh, who says, please describe the characteristics of asymptomatic patients or population used to evaluate, or oh, okay, she specifically meant on the pan bio test, uh, were these asymptomatic contacts confirmed cases or asymptomatics with no epidemiological links? I guess this goes to uh, Dr. Kuku. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the study was conducted in Brazil. So um, the, it was a mix of people. Some people were the asymptomatic contacts, but other people were pe people selected for it. Um, at that time when the study was done, there was some political activity or elections or something in Brazil. So people who attended the um, political rallies. Uh, so obviously they must have been asymptomatic for them to have, um, have to have, they were found in an, in a coincidental uh, manner and they were not, uh, they were not presenting to any healthcare center. So there is a mix and we will be able to, um, to, to outline the date, the data um, in, 
very shortly to, to show how how many of those people were contacts and how many of them were were just um, people that were random people that were found in a, in political rallies, for example. The issue with the asymptomatic also is that for the for people that are in the asymptomatic settings, they would um, you would want to identify even the one or two people that are um, that are, um, are are contagious in in that kind of setting. So maybe in a rally or in a sports event, you would anybody that you could identify is going to have a, a vast Im impact in terms of the onward spread of the disease. And that would, so you would get a, a lower diagnostic yield than if you were testing people that are symptomatic or people that are known and strong contacts of symptomatic people that are presenting at a healthcare center for screening. So the, the context is different. But um, yes, we did test people that were completely asymptomatic going about their normal um, normal life and found that the test was still able to identify um, those that were uh, positive um, to a, ve a very high degree when compared to PCR. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for that as well. Uh, I want to pick this question uh, uh, question that came from, um, it came in French. I hope my interpretation here is, is okay. Uh, but uh, it, it came from, let me just confirm, uh, from Marcel. Uh, and Marcel says, um, is the performance of Abbott <clears throat> at 100% uh, because we use for, uh, because they use for travelers uh, and, and test any positive test uh, and the she feels the, the these tests are always coming out positive. Is that um, is that the case? I think for for her, the, the, the complaint is all the tests are always coming out positive. So, what could this mean? So the performance characters we presented the sensitivity and specificity are in the nineties. So, um, but as to what, why people would would be positive. Uh, as travelers, um, maybe it's because they, they have COVID. Um, yeah, it's not it's not that the test has, the, the performance characteristics are, are, are within the requirements and our, our sensitivity and specificity are over 90%. Thank you very much. So I don't yeah. know whether I'm answering the question correctly. I think you are. Uh, I okay. think she was worried about uh, how, why almost all of the tests are positive and uh, Maybe we can also cross reference to what uh, Dr. Anna presented in terms of where there's need for confirmatory testing if, yes. they, uh, yeah, if, if there is high suspicion of uh, you know, uh, positivity, maybe there, there isn't. Uh, as we are about to round off, um, I, I want to acknowledge quite a number of uh, uh, contributions that are coming really into the chat and uh, thank you all for the expertise uh, that is coming out there. And specifically, I will single out this one from Kondo K. Jamil. Uh, and uh, he or she tried to also weigh in on the waste uh, uh, management part where he says the twisted waste or swab decontamination, you use 1% hypochlorite or chlorolox um, or bleaching solution or soap water or alcohol-based disinfectants used at home. This is what they are using in the country. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't mention which country uh, this is. So uh, many thanks again uh, for, for, for that. Uh, as we round off, um, Dr. Aina, in 30 seconds, what uh, uh, closing remarks can you, can you give? Sorry, I need any, to ask Any you. last words, any last words in about 30 seconds? Sorry, once again, may I ask you to repeat because <laughs> for yes. me, uh, I was saying yes. What, what what would you like to say as we are about to close? Any any final words from you? Yeah, thank you. First, I would like to say thank you very much for uh, this invitation and for this great section and uh, to my colleague uh, Dr. Kuku and to all organizers including Dr. Anafi and all other organizers and to all participants and what I would like to say please take care and uh, <laughs> and thank you very much once again and hope we will manage this 
COVID-19 soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kuku, uh, any last words? Yes, thank you, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Anafi. Um, so um, what I would say is that even as we are um, in Africa, we know that we are very much behind in the rollout of the, the vaccines, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of issues around um, around um, the vaccine rollout in the countries that are rolling out. So this emphasizes the fact that testing still is very important and is actually the only real critical key that we have in order to to, to control the, the, uh, the uh, overall spread of, of the pandemic. So we need to continue to emphasize testing and also to make testing more accessible to people and remembering that people will be requiring to have repeated testing um, and it's not a one-off thing. So we, um, we are looking forward to um, um, coming up with an innov any innovation that would help um, to spread um, the available of all forms of testing from the lab lab based testing nucleic acid amplification to our um, uh, point of care testing oh, we still need to be um, very much um, involved in testing so and I would also like to thank ASLM for being the place that is uh, that we come to to get our information to get our updates and really for the leadership role that you are you are showing globally I'm sure it shows even in the num the the geographical spread of people that um, dial into your our de our weekly fixes of information. So thank you very much, Anafi, and to your colleagues for all the work that you're doing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuku, for the kind words okay, again, uh, and for also calling them weekly fixes. <laughs> so many thanks. Um, and uh, I just also want to acknowledge uh, also other questions that came through into the chat that we couldn't address. Uh, also very re relevant, I saw questions around vaccines and also saw people trying also to respond that vaccines are not going to necessarily uh, prevent the infection, but maybe uh, they will also uh, help us, I think, maybe reduce in terms of uh, the burden coming through. And uh, it seems also a, a major, I think, theme that is coming through. So hopefully one of the sessions that will come would also address uh, that area as well. Also want to like to thank uh, Abbott uh, and uh, Beckman for coming through today, uh, and specifically the presenters, Dr. Kuku and uh, Dr. Anna for the wonderful presentation. And uh, thanking you all for coming through as usual and also having uh, these lively scientific uh, discussions. Please watch out for more uh, of the sessions that are coming through. Uh, we shall continue to advertise them in the usual uh, media. So what's left for me is to just direct your attention to the screen. For those that want to uh, get certificates of attendance, please feel free to go to the SLM Academy and uh, follow the instructions there and download your certificates. Um, what's left for me is to say goodbye, uh, hopefully in the several languages that are presented here, goodbye in English. Those that are in the Comoros, they like to say kwaheri, uh, au revoir to, their, to our French speaking colleagues. Salasinte, Warren, Tate, Mussolini, who also was very active in the chat. Uh, those in Ghana, I hope I'm not pronouncing this wrongly. They say Macro, is that so, Dr. Kuku? And our Arabic uh, speaking colleagues, Masalam, Salam alaikum. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you.